So before we begin this video, I want to make it very clear I love the X-Men. Maybe too much. My brain sort of gets a little, like, brain rotted when I see X-Men stuff. I just get excited. It's inevitable. You know, it's they're, they're not even my favorite Marvel team. They're, like, third behind the Fantastic Four and the Guardians of the Galaxy. But, like, I really do love the X-Men. I love the X-Men characters. And this viewing guide is going to reflect that because... I want to talk about everything that's been adapted because it's kind of like how I got into X-Men and I wanted to like share my love of it, but there may be some hot takes, there may be some opinions thrown about, because the best way to describe X-Men media, and this goes for both the comics and the movies, it's like Scooby-Doo or Lupin the Third. You know, most of it's just going to be pretty good, but okay. There's going to be some really bad stuff that you never want to experience again, but then there's going to be such good stuff that you'll just never know what you're going to get. You know, you're either going to get the greatest thing you've ever seen, a mix of mediocre, or just something really terrible. And with that said, I'm going to guide you through the X-Men Adapted Media to figure out what all of that is and where you should start watching. And there's going to be a lot of opinion this time. I usually keep the opinions out of the viewing guides, but I feel like with this, I just can't help but share my love for the X-Men. So let's begin. It's Morphin Time. Special shout out to all our channel members, including our Captain Tears, Infinity War Torn, Spin Dash 54, Super Shaddix Boom, Toma K, Jamie's World, Matthias Laura, Don Don Ranger Power, Donnie Waldman, Dr. Grid, Jeremy Carr, It's La Dorman, Toka Texas Cosplay, Common Pikachu, Sitar Goes the Kaiju from Krypton, Brendan Overland, and AMG and Marco 27. If you'd like to support the channel, hit the join button down below for more details. Hello, this is Sanat here, and welcome to my viewing guide on how to watch X-Men specifically in the animation and live action departments and film and TV adaptations of the X-Men, not including the main comics, not including video games, because those feel like different things. This is a guide that I'm producing at this point in time because this is being uploaded on the day that X-Men 97 premieres. And with the upcoming Deadpool and Wolverine movie, I thought what better time than to talk about the fun timeline of the Fox X-Men movies, because I have looked over that detail way too much in my life, and I wanted to share it with all of you. So what this video is going to essentially be is a guide to X-Men adapted media. If you're asking, what are the X-Men? Not exactly the right video for this, but to give you the basics, X-Men are a group of mutants, people who are born with superpowers that usually emerge during their teenage years, and they are training and helping the next generation of mutants while also fighting threats from both humanity and also mutants who want to conquer the world. That's the basic premise, but there's a lot of layers to it. I really love the X-Men, and I could talk about this forever, but i got to keep this on track. The big thing with this guide is we're going to do two parts to it. Part one, of course, will be animation, which is highly regarded as the best X-Men material out there, because uh, a lot of the thing is with superhero media, and I agree with this, animation is usually the best format to adapt comic books, simply because you're going from a highly stylistic art form to a highly stylistic art form, as opposed to taking a high stylistic art form and putting it into live action. However, of course, we will talk about the very famous and popular X-Men live action movies and shows. Uh, there is a lot of them, and I'm going to boil it down and make it simple. So this guide is going to be a two-pronged X-Men 97 prep, as well as a guide to all the animated shows, as well as Deadpool and Wolverine prep, as well as a guide to all the live action movies and shows. And there may be stuff in here you've never heard about, because I really went for the obscure stuff. This is going to be a heck of a viewing guide. Now, before we get too far ahead, if you want other guides like this for other franchises, I will direct you to the viewing guide playlist. We've had a lot of viewing guides on the channel so far. This is becoming a regular series, and I plan to do more in the future. This one may be a little bit shorter than some of those, because we got less to talk about, which is good. I'd also like it if you hit the like button and subscribe to the notification bell if you haven't already to help this video go out to more people and for more videos like this to continue because I love doing these viewing guides. So with all that said, I think it's time to dive right in and not waste too much more time. Let's begin with the animated X-Men series. So one thing I wanted to note for historical purposes is that the X-Men were not super popular prior to 1992, at least with the general public. The X-Men themselves had their original comic book run that was pretty much almost canceled before it was revived by the giant size X-Men run that kept the X-Men going until the present day. But the thing was is that the X-Men hadn't really broken out into media. The earliest appearances of the X-Men in adapted media for Marvel 
was on the Marvel superhero shows and appearances like in Spider-Man and his amazing friends, where Wolverine was voiced with an Australian accent, which seemed to be prophetic of Hugh Jackman's casting many years later. But in 1989, there was a pilot produced for a series that did not get picked up and is now known as Pride of the X-Men, which saw the X-Men having introduced a new member to the team, being the mutant Kitty Pride, and seeing things through her perspective as she learns about how the mutants and the X-Men and the conflicts go. It also happens to have the same roster of X-Men characters from the X-Men arcade game, and that's just kind of a fun tie-in. Now, sadly, Pride of the X-Men was also not good, but it also didn't get picked up, so there was no further adventures of the X-Men. However, three years later, Margaret Lesh, who was working at Marvel Productions on the Pride of the X-Men pilot and other productions, she became the president of the Fox Kids Network and gave X-Men another chance. And that is the series that we all know now as X-Men the Animated Series. In 1992, X-Men premiered on the Fox Kids Network and propelled the team and the characters into the spotlight. It was a highly rated show, lots of kids were watching, and it really got a lot of acclaim for its writing and its overall presentation. And that was really where X-Men began, with X-Men itself. Now, it is referred to as X-Men the Animated Series in the same way that Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series at the time they aired were just called Batman and Superman and also Spider-Man the Animated Series was just Spider-Man, but it's something we've just put a delineation on so you don't confuse it with the movies that came later. But this series was a breakout success and a smash hit of a show. If you're wanting to watch X-Men, there are two different ways, essentially. You can watch it on Disney Plus in almost every region, as far as I know. They pretty much have the whole streaming rights, but there was a DVD release, at least in Region 1, that was provided the entire series across five volumes. I found Volume 2 and Volume 4 are much harder to find than the other three at the current day, and that's the point I even have a Canadian release of Volume 2. Um, but there are other countries' DVD releases of the show, though your mileage may vary depending on your region. Unfortunately, we haven't seen a better release since because these DVDs are notoriously out of order. Episodes are just a jumbled mess once you get past the first two seasons, and that's really unfortunate. However, thanks to great resources like Eric Lewald's previously on X-Men The Making of an Animated Series and the wonderful X-Men The Animated Series art book that was released, there is easy resources to find what was the intended order of episodes, especially because three episodes from season three got pushed off to season four, and that sort of causes some continuity problems due to a lot of behind-the-scenes issues. Now, luckily, currently on Disney+, Plus at time of recording, the episodes are in order. But if you're watching them on your DVDs and you want to know the proximate order, we have that covered. So using Eric Lewald's previously on X-Men book as my main resource, I have compiled it season by season and broken it up as the seasons more so to air date as opposed to production order because some of the uh, season numbers are kind of off. But we're going to break this down for you guys so that way you'll be able to see it. I'm going to put the correct order for each season up here like this, like I did for season one, and talk briefly about each season. I recommend you pause and take a screen cap if you need it and that will give you a good idea of what order these should be in. So season one aired in 1992, lasting for 13 episodes. This first season kicks off the series, it brings out the characters, and it's actually a serialized story. Every episode leads into the other, because what they'll typically do is have an A plot and a B plot, and the B plot will usually carry forward to the next episode and become the A plot of that following episode. And that makes for a really cool format, and it's a really great way to get introduced to the characters. In 1993, season two aired also for 13 episodes and continued the serialization in a different way. Whereas season one, again, had that A plot, B plot thing going on, season two sees the X-Men go on more episodic adventures with little stingers in the episodes, usually about a minute or two long, that tie to an overall plot that gets wrapped up in the season finale two-parter. In 1994, season three lasted for 19 episodes, so a lot longer, and these are more standalone. However, there are more multi-parters, including the Phoenix and Dark Phoenix sagas being a five and four-parter, respectively, taking up a good chunk of the season. Those multi-parters sort of play episodic in a way, but they do uh, have an intended order. And this is where the order gets screwy on the DVD sets, so this guide hopefully is helpful for you all out there. Season 4 aired in 1995 for 21 episodes. And this season was kind of just continuing the show, and it was intended to end the series with the Beyond Good and Evil four-parter. That was supposed to be the end of the show. It was going to complete the run, 
and they essentially let go most of the creative team at that point because they were ready to move on to other projects. Also during season four, Spider-Man season two episodes four and five aired, which was a crossover with the X-Men. It's a pretty cool two-parter and ties into the Spider-Man ongoing serialized story that was going through that season. And this aired at the same time as episodes 11 and 12 of X-Men. So while you can watch this two-parter as part of your X-Men watch after the show, you could also just watch it during season four or after season four. And then in 1996, season five aired lasting 10 episodes. This was kind of the weakest season because you had a lot of the creative team was gone. They'd moved on to other projects. They used a different animation studio where everything gets really wonky looking. And while there are still good episodes in here, there definitely is. I wouldn't say season five is anybody's favorite, but there is still good stories to be told. And the finale to this leads into future things like X-Men 97. So if you're like me and love the 90s X-Men show, you're probably wondering if there's any continuations or any comic tie-ins. And you probably have seen some online when you've done your own research. And well, there is, there's plenty of them. And I read them all. I read them all for my own enjoyment, but also for this viewing guide. And so I read them so you don't have to. And here's my guide on what these are. First things first, the ones that are collected in the Omnibus Edition X-Men Animated Series, The Adaptations, is X-Men Adventures from 1992, lasting 15 issues, and is an adaptation of the first season of the show, episode by episode, with some pretty stellar artwork. It's really nice to see kind of like you know, the current Marvel talent at the time take a crack at the stories from the show. Then in 1994 for 13 issues was a season two adaptation, which also is pretty solid as well. 1995's X-Men Adventures 1 through 13 covers season three of the show, but not the entire thing. It mostly focuses on Phoenix stuff. And uh, sadly, the artwork isn't as uh, the same as before. I found that the artwork sort of degraded in quality over time, sort of like how the animation quality of the show did. But overall, if you're wanting to read some X-Men 90s comics that are related to the show, these adaptations are pretty solid, and I can see why Marvel chose to put these in an omnibus edition, because I enjoyed these quite a bit. The comics collected in X-Men the MA series, The Further Adventures, are not so hot. This volume contains the backup stories of the Spider-Man magazine that featured the X-Men, which are mostly four-page stories that largely ignore the continuity of the show. There's some really weird stuff with Jubilee's parents in this. Then there was Adventures of the X-Men from 1996, which was not a season four adaptation, but was in fact news stories, and saw the X-Men team up with characters they weren't legally allowed to at the time, like the Hulk or Man-Thing. There's all kinds of kind of stuff in there. It also ends super, super weird in a way that I don't want to spoil, but I also want to say this is canon in any way. These are further adventures, but they do not line up with the continuity of the show whatsoever. During 2015's Secret Wars event, they brought back some ideas and concepts, including X-Men 92, starting off with a five-issue miniseries. While it looks like it's supposed to remedy reminiscent of the show, it sort of is reminiscent of the 90s era. It is not in continuity with the series. This directly contradicts the entire finale, and because it takes place on Secret Wars' battle world, it doesn't fit at all. This also had a 10-issue follow-up, and uh, this isn't great. To be honest, I read all of these, and I don't recommend anybody reading these. They might be fun if you enjoy 90s X-Men-style stuff, but if you're looking for something that continues or goes with the animated series, this ain't it. And then there's the very bizarre X-Men 92, House of 92, uh, 92 being in Roman numerals, which is essentially like a play-by-play -play of the Krakoa era of X-Men up through Inferno, but done with the 90s X-Men characters. It has no continuity with the show, it doesn't have any continuity with the previous X-Men 92 comic, and it's pretty much only enjoyable if you've read the Krakoa era of the X-Men comics and want to see what would happen if they did that in the 90s. That's what that is. Now for a comic that should matter to the overall continuity, though I can't say for sure it's not out yet, is the X-Men 97 four-issue miniseries that is advertised as a prequel to the new show, X-Men 97. Now, X-Men 97 is a sequel to X-Men the Animated Series. Taking place in 1997, which is the year the show ended, this is going to be picking up the day after the final episode, Graduation Day. I have not seen this yet, as this, is com this video is coming out the day this airs, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what is going to be involved. Uh, Eric and Julia Lewald, as well as art director Larry Houston, all who worked on the original show, are all consulting producers on the series, and from what I've seen so far, it seems to carry the spirit and also the kind of like animation style in a lot of ways. I'm really looking forward to seeing a new X-Men show because it's been 13 years since the previous one, which we'll talk about later, but it's nice to see something new with X-Men, even if it's a continuation of a show that had 76 episodes, it didn't necessarily need a continuation. But this is absolutely the safest bet when you're investing money into an animated show. 
This will be streaming exclusively on Disney Plus worldwide, and there is one season of 10 episodes airing this year in 2024, with a second season in production right now that should be airing next year, and a third season that's now begun development. So it seems like this is getting the X-Men back on track and getting on top of the world again. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. But let's continue our viewing guide, because there were other X-Men shows past the 90s, and in fact, they're ones you want to check out. To tie into the upcoming X-Men live action film, X-Men Evolution debuted in 2000 and ran until 2003 for four seasons. This show takes a different approach than the X-Men animated series did. The X-Men animated series kind of took a traditional approach to the X-Men. Evolution tried to revamp some stuff, and I kind of appreciate what they've done here. For the most part, the main X-Men are teenagers, and they are going to high school, with some of the X-Men, such as Wolverine, Storm, and Beast, being adults who are mentoring and teaching the students. That way you get the school dynamic of the mutants teaching the future generation without the future generation having to be sort of, not to say no-name characters, but lesser-known characters. You can have the main cast of your X-Men be a mix of the two, and I think that's really cool. And this also allowed for a lot of storytelling opportunities, as the world does not know about mutants when the show begins. This is a great show, and it's especially, I think, the most complete-feeling X-Men show out of the four animated shows because it did have its own ending while it could have continued further it definitely felt like it wrapped everything up by the end the show is available to stream on disney plus should be in most regions and while it did have a dvd release the dvd release is incredibly hard to find now and it is incomplete they never released season four at all so the breakdown of this show episodes wise is in 2000 season one was 13 episodes season two in 2001 was 17 episodes in 2002 season three was 13 episodes and in 2003 as well, season 4 was 9 episodes, and that covers the whole show. So I think it's a pretty good binge, it's a good watch, I actually highly recommend it. And if you're a fan of the show that wants a big continuation, there was a 9-issue X-Men Evolution tie-in comic. Now this comic, for the most part, could be canon. It absolutely fits the continuity for 7 of its 9 issues. I read this over the weekend, so I'm brushed up on my X-Men Evolution comic. The first three issues are prequels to the show taking place prior to Season 1, it's totally fine to read them prior to Season 1. Issue 4 takes place sometime after Season 1 before Season 2, and Issues 5 and 6 are a little bit stickier to place. They take place sometime after Season 2 Episode 1, before Season 2 Episode 4, but they kind of have some spoilers, so if you haven't seen the show, I'd recommend reading these after Season 2. Uh, at least, you know, four through six, read them after season two. It's a little bit easier. And you should also throw issue seven in that. So kind of read four through seven after season two if you've never seen the show. But if you want to read it, you know, during season two, that's your approximate placement. Now, issue eight runs into a continuity problem that is not the show's fault nor the comic's fault. Issue eight introduces the characters of the Morlocks a few months before the show introduces the characters of the Morlock in season three. And since both versions of that story have the X-Men encountering them like it's the first time, I gotta say, issue eight's probably not canon. I will take the show's canon over the comic canon. And issue nine could be canon during season two. However, it has the same plot as a season two episode, which is that the X-Men throw a party when Xavier's out of town. And it does seem like it's the first time that happened in both versions. So again, I take the show over that comic. But those first seven issues fit in the continuity pretty good. And so again, I'd recommend reading the first three before the show and then reading 4 through 7 after Season 2 if you've never seen the show, and you read 8 and 9 for fun. Now the next X-Men animated series would be Wolverine and the X-Men, which was made to tie into the X-Men Origins Wolverine movie. Now this is kind of fun because this has some extended continuity beyond just its show, and that comes in the form of Hulk vs. Wolverine. This was a two-part film, Hulk vs. Wolverine, Hulk vs. Thor, and the Hulk vs. Wolverine part, even though it came out after, it actually is a prequel to the Wolverine the X-Men series, showing the first encounter between Hulk and Wolverine, and this is all followed up in an episode of Wolverine the X-Men featuring the Hulk. It's pretty awesome. Now, while that is pretty awesome, it's not on Disney+, Plus, and as far as I can tell, it's not on any streaming, but there is a Blu-ray release, and it was released on digital. It's typically packed in with the Hulk versus Thor. They're like a two-in-one bundle, essentially. Now, while that's optional, and you could totally watch Wolverine the X-Men without it, I do recommend checking it out. It's pretty great. Now, Wolverine the X-Men lasted for one season of 26 episodes in 2009, and the series saw a really cool 
like merger of all the ideas we had seen prior. This takes place after the X-Mansion has fallen. A cataclysmic event causes the X-Men to disperse and the team has to be reformed with Wolverine as the leader, a role he's not used to taking. In addition to that, it adds a lot of familiar elements of storylines that you would expect from X-Men stories like the Phoenix Saga or Days of Future Past, but it puts twists on them and adds a lot of variety and intrigue to it. Now, sadly, the series does end on a cliffhanger because there was an intended season two that would have done some more storylines such as Age of Apocalypse. And I've always kind of wished that if an X-Men show would get revived, it would be this one. But maybe X-Men 97 being successful would clear the path for a Wolverine the X-Men revival. You never know. It seems like everybody involved with the show is still working in the industry. But if you want to watch the show, it is streaming on Disney+, Plus, I believe, worldwide. And it did have a DVD release and a terrific Blu-ray release. If you can track it down and you love the show, make sure you love the show. But if you can track this down, it's absolutely worth it. This is a 26-episode show that has 29 commentary tracks. Because there was a commentary track for every single episode, and three of the episodes get two commentary tracks. It's the most loaded commentary track selection I've ever seen on anything, and I absolutely recommend picking this up if you love the show as much as I do. Now, in 2010, Marvel teamed up with Anime House Madhouse to create some Marvel animated projects. And two of those projects was Wolverine and X-Men. Let's talk about them one at a time. First up, Wolverine. Lasting for 12 episodes, it sees Wolverine go to Japan. It is an adaptation of the times that Wolverine's gone to Japan in the comics, and you see familiar characters and places. You may also be familiar if you've seen the movie The Wolverine, which has a similar approach. Highly stylized and highly animated, and kind of an interesting look for Wolverine himself. I quite enjoyed this. I thought it was a great time. The series itself can be found on DVD and on digital through Sony Pictures, who still own the rights to these shows. They're not currently streaming anywhere, but I've seen them pop up on Netflix from time to time. Also, this version of Wolverine did make cameo appearances in the Blade and Iron Man anime series, which were the other two that we're not talking about today from that Marvel anime project. So yeah, if you, you know, see them pop up here, that is definitely a thing that happens. Now, also in 2011, the X-Men anime takes a little bit different approach with their Wolverine design. He's not the same design in both, but it is the same continuity. And this has an interesting story. The X-Men go to Japan to meet a young mutant named Armor. And it's actually like, I think the only outside comics appearance of Armor. And it was my introduction to the character and I really like her. Plus it has Emma Frost in a prominent role. And it takes place after the X-Men have suffered a terrible loss in the form of Jean Grey dying. It's a thing that happens a lot. But this show I thought was pretty good and the design work is incredible. Once again, just like Wolverine, it was released on DVD and is available on digital purchase, but not currently available on streaming. Though, always check around, it may pop up somewhere. Now, sadly, that is the last X-Men animated show to exist prior to X-Men 97, which is a revival of a previous show. But hopefully in the future, we will see a new X-Men show continue the legacy of pretty good X-Men cartoons. So now we're going to talk about the slightly controversial and, you know, wildly variety and quality Fox X-Men movies. Now, since these movies are well known and I don't feel like I need to talk about them independently as much, we're going to be focusing on the timelines of them because I think that's the thing that confuses a lot of people. People watch these movies, but what order do they go in because they loved messing around with timelines and nonlinear storytelling? Things I like, but the general audience doesn't. So what we're going to do here is go through the movies in the main timeline first. And this is going to be my recommended viewing order if you've never seen them, or if you want to do a rewatch in case you're getting ready for Deadpool and Wolverine. So first things first, 2000s X-Men, which is available on streaming in Blu-ray, which most of these are available streaming somewhere. So I'm not just not going to say it unless it's you know, specific. X-Men is the way that you kick off watching X-Men movies. It's a great introduction. It gives you all the basic elements. It's not the best X-Men movie. They had to work out some of the kinks, but honestly, I still really enjoy watching this film, and there's a lot of great sequences in it that I really, really enjoy. Naturally, the next film in the timeline is X2, X-Men United, a great sequel, widely regarded as the best X-Men movie. I think it's second best controversial, I know, but a really great film that expands on the things that worked about the first movie, kind of worked out some of the kinks that were sort of missing from that first film. Pretty solid overall, though it's not without its flaws, it's definitely a great action-adventure movie. X-Men 3 The Last Stand sucks. It's bad. You gotta watch it, because the thing with X-Men is you have to go through the pain to get to the good, and this is essential to storytelling. And they, uh, this definitely isn't a good movie, and most people don't even want to watch it, but I say if you've never seen it, you should experience it. 
experience the pain because that pain will lead you to the Wolverine. The Wolverine is sort of the follow-up film to X-Men The Last Stand. It sees Wolverine after the tragic events of that film and how he's recovering. Plus he goes to Japan and he fights people on top of high-speed monorails. I really like the Wolverine and I highly recommend that if you're gonna watch the film, seek out a digital copy or a Blu-ray of the extended cut. It is an unrated cut, so there is a little bit more violence and a little bit more language than the PG-13 theatrical, which is still a good movie, but it just kind of lets Wolverine get his claws out a little bit more, and I quite enjoy this one. Now, like I said, we're doing this in proper watching order, or at least what I think is proper watching order, as opposed to release order. So that's why X-Men First Class, which came out two years prior to the Wolverine, would be my next recommendation. This is a flashback that sees the formation of mutants gathering together and the uh, origin of Charles and Magneto's relationship. There is a lot of great sequences in this movie and a lot of really cool moments. While it does have a lot of problems, Darwin for one, uh, it's not a perfect film, but I think it's quite enjoyable and it's nice to see the origins of this. But I recommend watching this after you've seen the others because those establish the X-Men better than this does. And then that leads us to X-Men Days of Future Past, a pseudo crossover between two casts of movies, the ones from the first class, which are the previous timeline, as well as the ones from the original trilogy. This is a continuation. This is sort of showing the disastrous timeline that the original X-Men timeline went into after The Last Stand, and it is showing them trying to fix it by traveling back in time and meeting younger counterparts of characters. This film had two cuts. There is the theatrical cut, which is shorter and was made for runtime in theaters, and there is what I think is the highly superior Rogue cut that features Rogue, who was cut from the theatrical, and a lot more sequences with the original X-Men cast. I would recommend seeking this out either on Blu-ray or digital purchase. It's not available on streaming, unfortunately, but I do think it's the better version of the movie. If you're going to be watching Days of Future Past, I'd recommend the Rogue cut. In fact, I've still never seen the theatrical to this day because when they said, oh, we'll release a cut later that has Rogue, I said, I'll just wait. Sometimes I'm petty like that, but I recommend Rogue cut. Now, the ending of this movie, minor spoilers, as it causes a split timeline to happen because they do meddle with the chains in the past, which does change their present, but it does split the timeline into a diverging path. So this is our split timeline one, following the younger cast that continued from First Class to Days of Future Past, and essentially this would be their third movie, X-Men Apocalypse. Okay, not many people love this movie, but I think it has, again, a lot of good moments, similar to a lot of things with these movies. I also do think that, like, James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender as Professor Xavier and Magneto kind of carry a lot of these movies. This is not different, but... X-Men Apocalypse sees the mutant apocalypse arriving into present day 1980s something, and he is wrecking havoc, and the X-Men have to form a proper team, which is pretty neat. And then following that up was the last film of that timeline, Dark Phoenix, which was yet another adaptation of the Dark Phoenix after X-Men The Last Stand, and sees what happens when Jean Grey goes to the Phoenix. Once again, a lot of great moments. I think the score is actually pretty good in this movie, but it's not the best film overall. But if you're invested in those characters and you want to see how the timeline would progress after the events of Days of Future Past, these two movies are where you should go. Now, this next bit is pure conjecture. And I mean conjecture in the sense that there has never been confirmation this is the case, but this is what I like to think. The second split timeline, which would be the timeline the original X-Men cast now hail from, I think is where Deadpool takes place. And I know that's weird to say because there is a little cutaway gag cameo in Deadpool 2, but I think it just makes more sense to fit here than it does in the other timeline based on how Dark Phoenix turned out. So Deadpool, I think, takes place in this timeline, but it could also take place in the other timeline. I'm just going to say it takes place in the fixed timeline. The first Deadpool film, an R-rated movie, uh, be warned. Everything else I've talked about outside of the unrated Wolverine cut has been PG-13. This is an R-rated film for violence and sexual content. Uh, the first Deadpool film, it is more of a comedy, is Deadpool. There's a lot of fourth wall breaking, so continuity is a bit of a weird thing, but that is where this would take place, in my opinion. Deadpool 2, following up from that, another R-rated film. There is an unrated extended cut, and there's a PG-13 Christmas cut that has Fred Savage in it, and it's kind of weird, but I like that it got a disc release. It's just weird that this thing exists, and it, it's kind of hilarious, because they have to censor all the swearing words. Um, but anyways, the Deadpool 2 followed up from the first Deadpool movie, saw the introduction of new characters like Domino and Cable, and had just another blast. And those films are popular enough, I feel like... You know, we kind of know about them at this point. Now, of course, the third Deadpool movie is going to be Deadpool and Wolverine in 2024. It's coming out this summer. And that, of course, means you probably should watch Deadpool 1 and 2. 
but I also don't know if you need to. It kind of seems like it's going to be going off and doing its own thing with Wolverine. And that also ties into all the other movies. So if you want to watch these timelines straightforward, you can skip over Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix, but if you want to follow the timeline, and get to Deadpool and Wolverine, there you go. Also of note, the X-Men have started popping up in the MCU recently, with Patrick Stewart reprising his role as Professor Xavier and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and Kelsey Grammer has returned as Beast in a scene in the Marvels. So the X-Men are starting to trickle into the MCU, it should be interesting to see when we'll get an actual proper X-Men movie. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the one-off movies for the Fox X-Men films. First of all, 2009's X-Men Origins Wolverine. This was supposed to be a prequel telling the origins of Wolverine. It was going to lead to a bunch of movies that were prequels and X-Men Origins Magneto got turned into first class or something. Not a great movie. I think it's notoriously infamous. And the continuity doesn't line up with what we saw in X2 and other X-Men films and the Wolverine. So I put it as a standalone one-off universe thing that you can skip or watch depending on how you feel. And while fantastic, Logan is also something I would consider a one-off. This is another R-rated film, mostly for violence and language, and there is a black and white version of it that's on this Blu-ray, which is kind of interesting. This is a hard, gritty, Western-style film where it sees Logan and Charles Xavier as the last mutants of the X-Men remaining. It's sad, it's depressing, and I don't want this to be in the main continuity because... It's kind of a bummer ending. There also is the 2020 film, The New Mutants, which was the last Fox X related movie. Again, I don't know how to place this in any continuity because it was supposed to set up other things that never happened. This is a one-off. It's done as a horror film. It follows the characters of The New Mutants. And while it is PG-13, I do have to warn, there was a lot of racism towards Native American people in the dialogue of this film, and I found it uncomfortable. So I just wanted to put that forewarning up front. Uh, this movie should have been better uh, and I don't like a lot of the creative choices made but it exists it's out there now Fox did try to adapt X-Men to live action TV in 1996 there was the pilot Generation X adapting the Generation X comic and actually featured our first uh, live action Emma Frost years before we got our first live action Wolverine this was just a pilot it exists on YouTube somewhere it's not been really officially released lately um, but it's kind of a weird, wild, what-could-have-been world when they were trying to capitalize on the success of the animated series. A little bit more successful in 2017, the series Legion is kind of a uh, mature audience, drama-style, like HBO-style show that aired on FX. And this lasted for three seasons and saw the character of Legion, who is Charles Xavier's son, and kind of the mind-bending adventures he went on. The show makes you question what is real and what is not, and I think that's pretty cool. It's really well crafted and it is going to be more of that, you know, FX style drama, more so than like, you know, normal superhero stuff. But if you're into that, it's a good show. And then lasting for two seasons from 2017, 2019, The Gifted was, I think, the most successful attempt to adapt mutants to a television format. It saw a world where the X-Men had disappeared. Maybe the Logan timeline? I don't know. Um, but we got uh, different characters, including Polaris, who headline it and they are working together to save this mutant family initially, and it's got a lot of intrigue and interest. It sadly only lasted two seasons, it didn't get a third, but it's a pretty solid show overall. So that does it for my X-Men viewing guide. There is a lot of great stuff in the X-Men adapted materials, particularly if it's animated. There is a lot of good X-Men movies and ones that people may enjoy, and I don't want to have people's negative reaction to the overall package of the Fox X-Men movies to dissuade you from watching them. I think you should give them a shot if you've never seen them, and it's something that I think is kind of fun to see that version of adaptation of superhero stories at the time. They certainly have a soft spot in my heart because of growing up with them, but I do genuinely enjoy several of the films, so I would recommend checking them out. And I think it's kind of fun to watch things in that main timeline. You can skip the one-offs, but just that main timeline guide I gave, that X-Men through Days of Future Past section is just really satisfying to watch as a whole package. And I recommend any of the animated X-Men shows. They're all great. So that is my guide. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't hit the like button and subscribe to the notification bell already, I really appreciate if you do that. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me what your favorite X-Men movie or show is. Tell me if you hate the X-Men, whatever you want to go with. Just let me know your thoughts down below. Also, be sure to check out the channel memberships if you would, hitting the join button down below for more details. There are perks such as early access to videos, and I'll send out little extra member updates and things through that, so check it out. Also, you can find our live streams on this YouTube channel Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern, where we talk about X-Men, movies, TV, comics, all kinds of good stuff. Also, our Discord server in the link below, where you can discuss pretty much everything we discuss on this channel and more. You can find me on social media if you wish, at SoundOut12, across most platforms. You can find my Oscar Graphic Designer on social media and on Discord at DarkClaw643. 
You can find Hero Club at hero-club.com for comic news, reviews, and more. And until next time, this is Sandout saying, to me, my X-Men.